well, in the interest of time, I'm going to start talking while they're uh, solving technological issues, I hope. Uh, my name is Jim French, and I'm going to give the first half of this presentation, and my colleague and friend, Dr. Joel Sercell, will be doing the second half. And I don't know whether he's hoping I speak long or short, but I'll try to give him his fair share. What we're going to talk about here is in the nature of infrastructure. Everybody say, Ugh. But anyway, you've got to talk about that. And what I'm really talking about is, is, is beneficiation from outer space resources of useful materials, particularly, well, everything you can think of, really. But the, I got to thinking when Joel has come up with this rather innovative mining concept and then helping him out a little bit with architecture and thinking about it, I got to realize that once we get past these first missions, you know, Bob, Bob Zubrin's Mars Direct or uh, Case for Mars or which, whichever, whichever scenario you want to pick, and everybody, almost to a person, Jeff Bezos, uh, Elon Musk, uh, Richard Branson, are all talking about the day when we have industrialized space and in essence de-industrialized the Earth, letting it go back to a more natural state where we can live without so much concern about pollution and, and all, all the other problems that plague us today. Well, if you're going to do, if you're going to industrialize space, and by analogy with Earth, one of the things that you require, besides raw materials for your processes, <coughs> is a means of transport. And rapidly, when you start looking at it for Earth, the uh, propellant for, for transportation becomes one of the biggest items in your family budget, almost immediately. And if we don't use stuff in, that we find in space for this purpose, then you're going to find that the majority of it has to come from Earth. And I don't care what your manufacturing process at Earth is, I mean in space is, it's not going to be a profit-making enterprise as long as you have to haul everything you use, everything you eat, everything you breathe, everything you burn in your rocket engines, etc up from the surface of the Earth. The gravity well is our biggest enemy. And any propellant that you pr produce is worth more at the top of the local gravity well than it is at the bottom. And by what I mean worth more is the expense of getting it from where you generate it to where you're going to use it. Is, uh, you know, that's the cost of doing business, and that's what you want to minimize. For one thing, we want to change our philosophy about uh, loading everything up, all the propellant we're going to need for the whole mission. You don't do that anymore. You've got to, you got to repropel it. I hate using refuel in terms of a rocket vehicle, so I say repropel it. At every node in your transportation circuit, you wouldn't have a very successful airline if you loaded a, the plane full of fuel and passengers in New York flew it to Los Angeles and then had to fly back again on the same load of fuel. Not that it could not be done, <clears throat> but the payload versus your takeoff weight would be ridiculous. You'd never make any money. And the same laws tend to operate in space. Well, we've got water and other volatile materials, which are the things you're going to need primarily for propulsion. And let me say, by the way, even if we get into nuclear thermal rocketry or uh, or uh, electric propulsion or whatever, you still need something to throw overboard. And electric propulsion, for example, doesn't solve all your needs because you need the high thrust to weight ratio, lower ISP propulsion, just as much as you do the <coughs> low thrust, high ISP propulsion. So we're going to need <coughs> all these materials that, that we can beneficiate from, from bodies in space. And to start with, it's probably going to be plain old everyday uh, propellants like LOX hydrogen, LOX methane, and so on. Now, you can get that. We know we can obtain these materials from Earth, the Moon, the near-Earth asteroids, and pr 
pro and for Mars, because there, there we have the advantage of the uh, atmosphere providing us with functionally unlimited amounts of CO2 just for the compression. Probably the Martian satellites, although at this point we do not actually know what the water con and volatile content of Phobos and Deimos are, but we need to find that out. And contrary to what Bob was saying this morning about not need needing a space station in near Earth space, you don't for his plan to go to Mars, and we shouldn't stop to build it to, uh, before, before we do the first mission. However, if you're talking about a solar system-wide transportation system, transportation network, then you need a node in orbit around the Earth, prob probably in one of the, L the uh, L elaboration points, L1 or L2, because L4 and L5 don't do you that much good, or in the, a, a distant lunar orbit. But you need something because you need some place to store your propellant, to service your spacecraft, to work on them, turn them around, and send them back out again. You don't send them back down to Earth for their major overhaul, because that's a waste of time, money, and a lot of propellant. Uh, so I, I said this already, there are numerous possibilities for this, for this base, and I won't talk further about that. Um, having a depot in, elite, in low Earth orbit is fairly useless because it's way down in the gravitational well. You'd be far better off storing and replenishing your pellet, propellant from up around uh, L1 or the DLRO, and using that to fly back down and back up. That's still a better bargain than bringing it up from Earth with that 11 kilometer per second penalty that it, that it imposes on you. And this is just a, some artwork because we always like to look at pretty pictures of spaceships of, of, a, of the, uh, the, the node as we might conceive it in the, near the moon a mining spacecraft that, I'll talk about this a little more, but that go, and Joel will talk about it a lot, that goes out to the near-Earth asteroids to obtain propellant, and a vehicle that is capable of landing on and returning from the moon, and on occasion flying down to low Earth orbit using aero braking and so on. The propellant combinations that are easiest to do are the following. Lox hydrogen, everybody knows about that. Lox methane, we've been talking about that for decades. Finally, all of a sudden, it's starting to blossom with companies like the one to which I consult, uh, Blue Origin, and several others, starting to look at the advantages of liquid methane, not the least of which it's a whole lot cheaper than kerosene. Maybe they really love it, gentlemen. I, I, evidently, they do. <laughs> Should I dance around and spike my football? Or finally, solar heated water. Well, why do we care about solar heated water? Well, on account of that mining vehicle you saw, which is going to go out to the near Earth asteroids and beneficiate water and other substances and bring it back, there's no point in burning that stuff when you've got a huge set of solar collectors anyway. And Joel will explain why we have those solar collectors. They can heat the water up. And 375 is going to be pushing the state of the art a little bit. We could easily get 300. I could sort of guarantee that right off the top of my head. And then with improved materials, heat transfer, collection, efficiency, and so on, we can probably get up to 375, which is pretty respectable. But the point is, you don't even have to separate the stuff and burn it. You just collect it, freeze it bring it home using this solar energy. Now, where are we going to bring this from? We can generate propellant on the surface of the moon, we can generate propellant on the surface of Mars, but we talked, I talked at least, about wanting it at the top of the gravity well. Now, of all the gravity wells, if possible. Coming up from Earth, it's going to cost you seven or eight kilometers per second just to get into LEO, about 11 kilometers per second to get up to where we're talking about. 
even from the moon, it's going to cost you uh, probably three kilometers per second or something like that to bring stuff from the surface. So the, um, the bottom line there is that every thousand metric tons, say, a propellant, and I allow the 10% tankage factor because you presumably have to keep the stuff in something. Um, you've got to spend the numbers shown there, and I won't read them. You can read them faster than I can. That's what it's going to cost you every time you bring one of these from one of these locations to the, to the other. That is not an economically viable situation. So if you go through these numbers, it leads to, to me at least, it leads to this conclusion that it, that it dictates generating the propellant at the top of the gravitational well if, you are, if you're going to do it. And this just explains where the numbers come from to give them a little provenance. And the same sort of thing at Mars. We don't have, we don't have a big moon, but we have the little moons. And in some ways, it's a little harder to move around the Martian system even than it is around the Earth. But I think we definitely want to cons consider either Deimos or Phobos. Deimos is preferred because it's higher up in the gravity well, the usual reason. Phobos is not too bad, but Deimos is a lot better. So which, which one we pick, and, that, and whichever one of those we pick is going to be the node for the Martian system, equivalent to the space station type thing I talked about before. And which one wins is the one, one with the best volatile content. All things being equal, we would prefer Deimos. Uh, now th this is some, um, some work that Joel has done in his company, Transastra. And I'm not going to try to run through the numbers, but you can read them for yourself. The amount, the amount of savings that you get from, from uh, asteroid resources is substantial. And why is that? Because the near-Earth asteroids, energetically speaking, are the easiest place to go from this station in DLRO or L1, wherever it is. We do a swing by of Earth, head it out, go to the asteroid belt, Get, it, get our, our plunder and bring it back, and all that for less delta V than it would take to land on the moon once. So functionally, the place to make water or whatever propellant we use for use it at the node in, our, in the Earth-Moon system is the near-Earth asteroids. Now, someone will say, well, yeah, but it's going to take a lot longer. We can get up from the moon from, from launch to being, being docked is maybe an hour or two. It's going to take weeks, at least, to get this stuff back from the asteroid belt. And that is true. The first time we do it, it's going to take a long time. But let me give you an analogy, a little known one. For many, many, many years, Australia exported wheat to Great Britain. I suppose it still does. Back in the days before World War II, they shipped it on sailing ships around the Cape of Good Hope and so on. Those sailing ships were much slower than a powered vessel. So it took months for the wheat to get there. But once you get the pipeline established, and that's the way you need to look at this as a pipeline, once it's established, you no longer have a problem because there's always a ship coming into port with a load and there's one leaving Australia or or wherever you're, or whichever asteroid you're going to, with a new load. So well, functionally, it's a pipeline. Now, that's not going to happen instantaneously. We're going to have to do a lot of missions in the old, conventional, bring most of your stuff with you fashion to get this established. But once it's up and running, the time it takes doesn't make a hell of a lot of difference. And even if, it, you know, if we get behind, if one of the ships conks out and doesn't make it, we always can bring stuff up from the moon or from, from Mars, but that's not the operating mode, that's the emergency mode. So this, I th I've covered most of this, but uh, in fact, that's what I just said, that uh, the, what I was talking about is for a mature space economy, and we may have to do something different in, in, the, uh, in the interim. And I'm about to finish here because 
I, I, these are some operational thoughts that I think you can read, and if you want to talk about them later, I'm happy to do that. I've talked about that already. One question is, are there near Mars asteroids? The answer is yes, there are several that cross Mars. There's at least one Mars Trojan, and even the inner belt of the asteroids is not terribly far from where uh, from Mars. So there's plenty of potential there. We just don't know yet. We haven't had a chance to assess what the utility of these asteroids is. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Cercel to tell you how to make water out of rock. Thanks, Jim. So I'm going to project my voice for the most part. Oh. So it's, it's important to introduce Jim French, who just spoke. So he's the co-author of the book Space Vehicles and something Space vehicles, uh, with uh, Mike Griffin, who is the former NASA administrator. I think I introduced Jim to Jeff Bezos in about 2001, and he's been working as a senior consultant for him ever since. I, is it okay that I said that? Um, and Jim uh, graduated from MIT in 1956, I think, 58, and started working on rockets in the Apollo program in the early 60s. He just published a book called Firing a Rocket, which is available on Amazon. I strongly recommend it. It has amazing true stories of 50 years of aerospace. Arthur C. Clarke said that if a distinguished, and Jim's over 80, so I can say L, L elderly scientist says something is impossible, he's almost certainly wrong. If he says it's, if it's possible, he's almost certainly right. When Jim says something's possible, it's possible. Um, my, name's, <laughs> my name is Joel Sircell. I'm the founder of Transaster Corporation. Transaster has won a handful of NASA contracts and grants in recent years. Um, I think I've won uh, a total of three NIAC grants from NASA. We recently completed a space economics study for NASA looking at the economic impact of asteroid mining for human exploration. Um, that table that Jim showed was uh, one of the summary tables from that study. And we also have some Silicon Valley venture funding. Um, and one of our cornerstone technologies is something called optical mining, which is a patent pending invention of mine. Optical mining stems from an observation that we made about concentrated sunlight. And that is, if you concentrate sunlight onto nearly any rock surface at about a thousand suns, what it does is it heats the surface and, and if you, at the, at the right intensities, it fractures the surface. Now you have to be careful not to melt the surface. If you do, you have to stop the process let it turn to glass and then hit it again. It fractures it through thermal shock. The fractured material, if the, if the rock surface contains water in the form of clays or carbonates or hydrates or molecular water or any other volatiles, pretty much all of the volatiles come out at high temperature. What happens is the small particles of the fractured rock outgas very quickly. And that outgassing process blows the particles off and cleans the surface. So this gave rise to invention called optical mining, where we realized we can dig holes in pretty much any type of asteroid surface with sunlight without using mechanical dig digging equipment. And we've demonstrated this in over three dozen experiments and demonstrations, and we've um, I've developed a mathematical model which goes into the physics and chemistry and gas dynamics in pretty much gory detail and explains how the process works. Um, in concept, what we would do is we will capture asteroids in bags. This is a technology that was originally proposed by NASA Glenn in collaboration with JPL and Caltech. And then JPL invested millions in it and has published the papers and done engineering demonstrations at TRL-4 on the ground of how you can bag an asteroid. Now, it doesn't have to be hermetically sealed, but you bag the asteroid, and then you use solar concentrators to inject highly concentrated light into the asteroid for that 
spalling process that enables optical mining. That causes the asteroid to be di disrupted. Gas is released, and you capture the gag bag in a secondary, you capture the gas in a secondary bag, which is passively cooled using second surface mirrors. The secondary bag just has to have the condition of hermeticity in the primary bag is that the holes have to be smaller than the hole to the secondary bag, which could be meters in diameter. Um, pressures in the primary bag are 10 to the minus 3 atmospheres, so this is still a vacuum by terrestrial standards. Um, and about a, a 5 meter diameter bag weighs a few hundred kilograms and can hold 100 tons of ice. You store the captured propellant as ice. Um, that's the concept of optical mining. We've designed various different vehicles. This was from our first NIAC study. Um, uh, this is a Falcon, roughly Falcon 9 compatible vehicle. It's about the physical size and mass of a large communication satellite. Um, you launch it to a low C3. It goes out to the asteroid. It's got all water propulsion, electrothermal for uh, attitude control and maneuvering, solar thermal for main propulsion. You fly it out to an asteroid, it can eat a, ten, a roughly 10 meter diameter asteroid, and our calculations suggest that with that, you can get 100 to 150 tons of ice. You leave the asteroid regolith behind, and you bring the ice back to that propellant depot that Jim talked about in lunar distant retrograde orbit, or we now feel as though L2 may be a better place for various different reasons. Subsequent to this study, our private sponsors asked us to look at what if you um, put this on a New Glenn? Well, it turns out the scaling is incredibly favorable. New Glenn has a much higher throw capacity than a Falcon 9, and instead of dealing with a 10 meter class asteroid that weighs about 1,000 tons, we can go to about a 6,000 ton asteroid and eat it and bring back um, vastly larger quantities of, I'm sorry, not 6,000 tons, 60,000 tons and bring back uh, thousands of tons of propellant in a single mission. So the scaling really works well when you go big. Um, this is a little video that the Discovery Channel did, which I don't know if we have sound. Let's find out. Uh, I don't know how to use Windows either. Let's see. Optical mining of asteroids can be a technological breakthrough that turns thousands of asteroids into refueling stations for spacecraft. This is one particular set But of first, demos. Joel Cercel has to see if he can actually extract vapors from an asteroid. In other words, he's trying to get water from a stone. Here we are at the White Sands Missile Range at their solar furnace facility. What we're gonna be doing is sunlight from the sun is gonna bounce off that giant mirror back there that, and it sends the rays through this giant Venetian blind and it'll go into a parabolic reflector and focus it down into a little four inch circle. Now we will have asteroid simulants inside of a vacuum chamber. The sunlight will hit the simulant and when it does, it, it'll be so intense that it'll fracture, break the surface of the simulant and drive uh, vapors out of it, water and carbon dioxide. We've done and as those vapors are driven out, it'll excavate or dig holes in the asteroid's area. Three, two, one, open. For large experiments, we use simulants because meteorites are five hundred and something degrees. Okay, let's shut it down. You can tell exactly where the light was coming in. It's right there. So what happens is, comes off just the as a highly concentrated light comes in, it breaks the surface of the material. And, and it heats the material. When it heats up, it lets so out water vapor and carbon dioxide. The process of breaking the surface and um, digging holes is called spalling. As you can see, we dug a big hole. And the spall process released debris, which is all collected inside the tank. The dream of asteroid mining is alive and well.
We think that this could be a, a, a very important transition for mankind as we move from being a purely terrestrial species to being a spacefaring species where our industries go in space. At that point, it will be possible for people to actually go and colonize and settle in space. So we've done a lot of economic emission studies and uh, those, those are going to be published online very soon. Um, we've published some of those at co in conferences uh, in more detail. Um, we've completed the low TRL feasibility demonstrations and math modeling. Um, we've done a few higher TRL uh, or high, la larger scale demonstrations. And right now we're funded through a combination of NASA and private sector funding to build a facility that we call the optical mining test bed, which involves the biggest light bulb in the world. It's 32 kilowatt light bulb, 19 inches long, draws 700 amps at 45 volts, and we have a giant electroform reflector that focuses that down onto a circle about this big, and we're doing 100, we're scaling up to do 100 kilogram class asteroid simulant test in a variety of different settings, and. Uh, our private sector sponsors are looking to uh, increase the funding rate very quickly. So um, we think the right way to go to the new world from Europe was to stop first in the Azores. And the tyranny of the rocket equation is such that if you, don't, if you refuel at various different nodes along the way, it completely collapses the total quantity of propellant you need. And if you're harvesting that propellant in space, it collapses the total cost of the enterprise. The two things that we've seen that reduce cost are public-private partnership and reusability. And, or the two things, the reusability is the next thing. And the next thing after that is space resources. And we think those are the keys to making mankind an exo terrestrial species. So, thanks. <laughs> Do we have any time for questions? Uh, like one or two as long as there's Sir. Do you have to modulate the lightning so that it gets caught in the other things that we also Yes. <laughs> That's the secret sauce. It takes about a meter, about an hour to go a meter. Okay. That's all the time we got for questions. Okay.